Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to edition 54 of the Food Safety Fridays webinar program. It's great to have a, another good turnout this week after last, last week's record-breaking webinar. Um, today we've got Oscar Rodriguez-Gonzalez uh, with us, and uh, Oscar's going to be presenting on food safety plans, uh, doing the hazard analysis right. We've all got to do hazard analysis as a, a fundamental part of our HACCP systems or harp Z systems or whatever. Um, and so you may as well do it as effectively as possible. It's very, in fact, it's vitally important that you do. So Oscar's going to be uh, giving us some tips, some rationale that we can use and some tips for getting that more effective. Uh, I'd like to thank, as I do always, the sponsors that bring this program to you uh, and get you some free education each week and a free certificate of attendance. They are our good friends at Trace Analytics, Safe Food 360, Metal at Toledo, and FSSC 22000. It's not easy to say that. Um, just to say, today's webinar is being recorded uh, as, you, as, as ever. Um, within 24 hours, we will distribute the slides and the webinar video recording and the certificate. So if you, if you can't hear anything, you have to go away or, or you can't see the qu slides quite clearly through the stream today, uh, there's no point in really keep typing in the sidebar. There's not a lot we can do about it during the live event. But as, as I say, we will follow up afterwards, uh, so don't worry about that. Um, Oscar's joining us today all the way from uh, Ontario in Canada. Welcome, Oscar. Nice to have you with us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again for the invitation. And, uh, uh, we, yeah, we've just been discussing the weather. It's nice and sunny there in uh, Toronto. Is that right? Yeah, we're in the summer here yeah. in the north. Yeah, and it's sunny here in Manchester as well. So we're bringing you sunshine all over the world today. So I'll be back with you shortly, Oscar, if you can get your slides ready. Uh, I'd just like to bring your attention to the, uh, in the sidebar, you'll see a, an image of Ruth Bell um, with the words trending root cause analysis for continual improvement. That's the next webinar. We're having a little hiatus for a few weeks for the summer recess, uh, so that the next Food Safety Fridays webinar will be on the 19th of August, Friday the 19th of August. And uh, during that webinar, Ruth will begin with some tips on the tools that we can use for root cause analysis. And also, when we do use root cause, anal cause analysis and we get data from that and looking at the trends, have we actually impacted positively on the business and uh, delivered improvements in uh, the bottom line, which is really important to uh, communicating with senior management um, and maybe getting some of their buy-in. Okay, um, I think that's all for now. We've got some polls during the webinar that I'll be uh, moderating and uh, I'll be back for the Q&A later. But for now, if you can get your slides uh, ready, Oscar, um, I'll head over to you. I think that's that's just about everything for now. So please do type your, your comments in the sidebar, um, chat to each other, ask questions, and uh, we'll we'll pick them pick them up later. Are you able to get your slides up? Are you struggling, Oscar? No, that's right. Uh, you, you, okay, over to you. Okay. All right. Um, thanks. Thank you again to all for attending the, the session. Um, we hope to give you inno innovative ideas, and, um, a different perspective of looking on uh, things that we take for granted. Um, what we're planning to, to discuss in this uh, presentation is a bit of um, how we do food safety planning and risk management hazard management, who set up management systems, um, focus on, on the different hazards or agents uh, and risk associated to to having uh, to deal with these hazards for human consumption, for, for human, um, how we control and uh, how we can control these hazards, the different uh, methods that we have for dealing with them. Um, how do we monitor? If we can monitor them and detect them, uh, 
we have to manage some information about what we are monitoring. Um, these ideas have been discussed previously and a few webinars with the International Food Safety and Quality Network and also within professional circles. Um, this is like an improvement of some things that have been uh, discussed and are getting shaped the more information I learn, the, the better the, the concept it gets. So it's a continuous learning um, um, process. Um, just a, um, a bit of um, refreshing of the concept is hazards is uh, the danger um, and because uh, the word in English may not be necessarily the agent causing the problem. It's uh, probabilities of, of having of having the problem. In this case, uh, if you look to rodeo, uh, the hazard for the people inside the rodeo may be violent, violent animals like a bull or a horse, and the risk is getting hit by the animal. And the people affected is the people inside the arena, but then uh, we have risk associated to the structure for the people watching the, the event, and there will be maybe more people affected by the problem. Um, uh, it, it's a different hazard, it's a different risk in the same situation, event. Um, there may be some risks that are uh, far away from the problem and may not be necessarily affecting uh, the event. Um, so this is just to, to put in perspective that uh, uh, when preparing for, for this type of events, we have to be prepared for anything that can happen. And if there is an emergency, we have to deal with it. If we can prevent it based on what we know that happens in, the, in this type of events, uh, we do everything we can to prevent it. Um, that's what the, the first uh, part of the presentation is about planning for food safety, uh, managing risks. Um, like we have talked before, um, it's about being proactive instead of reactive. Um, when people manage with metrics, they talk about leading indicators and lagging indicators or uh, it's doing things before they happen based on what we know rather than turning off fire when they occur and it seems like uh, this is the focus of the modernization act um, i haven't taken the qualified individual course but i did a, a some review on, on the concepts that they are introducing um, We'll be talking about about these concepts um, during the during this conversation. So the, the first question is, um, which type of tools for hazard or risk analysis and management are you familiar with? Uh, preliminary risk assessment, the hazard analysis and critical control plans. Uh, failure more and effect analysis, fault tree analysis, or, or any other risk analysis tool. Oscar, can I just ask a question? Um, are, you, yeah. have you, are you transitioning your slides? Because we're still on slide one. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So then, yeah, it still was because the full screen. Right, okay. Yeah. Okay. So we're on a we're on a we're on the poll. Okay, I'll start the poll. Okay. Okay. So uh, as Oscar was saying, uh, we're all familiar with different types of uh, risk analysis, hazard analysis tools. Um, can you um, mark on the poll which one are you most most familiar with? And as we can see, 
as you would expect, food safety practitioners, 90% um, are familiar with uh, HACCP. Um, unfortunately, it's not multiple choice because some people might, might be familiar with uh, more or all of them, but uh, the vast majority um, connect mostly and are familiar with HACCP. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like the food industry, uh, hazard analysis and critical control points plans is uh, has been promoted by the food industry. Um, the logic is uh, similar to what other uh, industries may be doing. Um, some of the adjustments to the hazard um, are related to the other tools and but to remember that um, it depends on what we're using them for. And that's the point of the presentation that the hazards are going to be the same. The control methods are going to be the same. We just have to present them different depending on the situation. And that's why the, the function or what is each tool is useful for will vary. Um, a preliminary risk assessment is like a narrative of the of the risk. Um, like what, what the risk can happen, uh, what's the hazard that may occur, um, what can we do to deal with it. Probably the uh, most similar tool that we use is the good manufacturing practices or good agricultural practices, where we get the list of uh, things that we have to do to deal with the hazards. And uh, good manufacturing practices or good agricultural practices, we don't necessarily see the hazard uh, described there, but we get things like uh, you have to have hand washing stations. Um, the GMP would not say you have to wash your hands because microbial contamination to the food, but uh, we are indirectly dealing with a, with a biological hazard introduced by humans working with food. Um, and most of the good manufacturing practices or good agricultural practices are based on a hazard analysis. So some a team of experts have done a hazard for seafood, a hazard for milk, has a for juices um, they determine that uh, juice has to be pasteurized or seafood has to be treated this or in this way because of the, this is what happens more common in the in the sector um, and that was based on a hazard analysis that was uh, hazard based analysis that was translated to uh, good manufacturing practices or good agricultural practices. So we're having um, monitoring systems and, and elements to deal with the problem. It just presented in a different manner. Um, I guess the question most common for companies dealing with uh, good manufacturing practices and hazard analysis, the why, would, why do we have to do uh, the same, uh, how, why do we have to tackle the problem just two, two times? If we have uh, a list of things to do f for controlling the, the hazards, why do we have to analyze it again? You just uh, identify that for incoming materials, we have to have a supplier program, is uh, for uh, the processing steps, we have to have a sanitation program, and we have to have a, a process monitoring controls. But then my, my suggestion is, uh, what well, you have to have, you may have a different process than what there was developed the standard. Um, so when you do your hazard, even if you are mentioning the same controls that the good manufacturing practice describes, now, if this is your take on what is more important for your situation, then it is something that 
you consider that that should be added or should be eliminated from the industry standard and and um, what the good manufacturing practices were based. On. Um, some good manufacturing practices we have things like uh, you have to have uh, environmental testing program and it has to be microbial testing or you have to have a uh, uh, if you do metal detection you have to monitor your metal detector every hour it's kind of mandatory um, when you do your hazard analysis you may determine that you don't need a metal detector but as a that's where you cannot check the system based on the hazard that your your team considers a uh, priority. Um, the failure more and effects analysis is uh, similar to the hazard analysis, except for that instead of uh, the way to select the critical control points or um, the priorities for controlling is, is based on risk um, like we will see later the way to decide for critical control point is to be a bit different than it was based on a decision tree how to come up with a critical control point in the failure mode and effects analysis is based on risk and this risk is, is based on, on priorities uh, depending on the severity of the hazard and other factors like occurrence and, and detectability. There are some other tools like a fault tree and, um, and others that are like similar to um, root cause analysis. Um, root cause analysis is more specific to, uh, to a given problem like uh, contamination with listeria or um, a piece of glass in the product then we analyze things like uh, where did it come from did it come from uh, a person working with the food if the person was sick did it come from the equipment that the equipment was not cleaned properly did it come from uh, um, the uh, the training of the people that was uh, there was not they were not using the right chemicals or uh, the equipment they were they were using for cleaning was not uh, in good conditions. Uh, so we're analyzing an event um, and all the possible causes. We can add probabilities of things happening. Um, and we can also use this type of tool for a bigger picture, like uh, not needing safety objectives or uh, shutting down the plant uh, because of food safety issues. So it's just a different way to, to analyze a problem and different levels. Um, so these tools, what they give us is a framework or a, like a bucket or a stand to put all the problems and the solutions um, and then be ready that when the problem arrives, we have priorities to of problems to deal with and we have solutions pre-planned for the problem it is like a troubleshooting manual that uh, anytime the situation occurs or the equipment fails we know we have an idea of the, where the problem may be coming from we have an idea of how we can fix it and we just go to the troubleshooting manual and say that it's not turning on because the battery is off or is not uh, um, uh, the color is, is fading because it's low low battery. So the same for for uh, for safety hazards. Um, we're having contamination with listeria because uh, we have a problem with the sanitizer. Well or maybe we're not cleaning the drains, or maybe we're, uh, it's a condensation in the cooling system. So we have a plan, and when the situation arrives, uh, we have an idea of where to look at and where it may be coming from. Um, so then 
when we're analyzing for this uh, type of problems, the, the most wanted or um, what we are looking for is the hazard or the agent causing the problem. Well, this is we have to kind of uh, refresh a bit or English language or or the language that we're talking Spanish or French. Um, the hazard and risk may be used interchangeably. And when we talk about hazards, uh, chemical, uh, biological, chemical, and physical, which is a, like a little bug or a, a chemical, uh, some people may be using the word hazard for the situation and maybe use interchangeably with risk. Um, that's why one of our projects is to um, help uh, people in working in food safety to understand that the, the cause of the problem is something that is known. We may not have the science to detect it or deal with it, but it's something that it can be, once it's identified, is uh, we can deal with, like it's, it's similar to when we are sick. The cause of the illness is, is an agent. We may be uh, dealing with symptoms and trying to treat the symptoms, but we'll have to, at the end, we have to, if we want to get rid of the problem, we have to know the cause of the problem. Uh, not just uh, treating the symptoms for, for some time. Um, so that's why the, the next question is, uh, if these five uh, items listed in the screen, are they full safety hazards or are not they full set, or they are not full safety hazards? Okay, yeah, I've loaded that in the sidebar. Um, I can see people are voting already. Uh, we've got almost 90%, in fact, over 90% are saying, yes, they are food safety hazards. And, um, well, actually it's changed now, 70, 30, 70, yes, 30, no. Um, so, well, are they food safety hazards, Oscar? Yeah, um, I guess it would depend on the perspective. Um, like uh, usually when we um, think about food safety, we we take a, a, a very negative perspective of things, or we think the worst case scenario. Um, most of this irradiation treatment is used to to kill microbes, uh, dry products, uh, meat products, uh, irradiated to get rid of microbial hazards. So it's good at some point, but then there are some limitations for the amount of irradiation that we can use. Um, we'll talk about later about radioactive hazards. Um, UV light is used for um, cleaning for microbes too, but uh, too much exposure to UV light uh, it's in person, in people, they, uh, they talk about cancer in the food, or we don't know what happened with the food. So excess of UV light may be a problem. We have to, to prove uh, up, to, up to which point we can use UV light. Fedges are a virus, but it's a virus that we know that is a good virus. And it's used about, against a specific bacteria. Like there are some virus that can kill listeria virus can they can kill e coli so we can use a biological agent to kill another a biological hazard uh nitrates and nitrates is so, um these two chemicals are used in food um at which level they become dangerous is something that we have to find before we start using them um so it's relative to the situation and it will matter of uh, we have to know about the science behind behind each of them to to determine when they are hazards and, and when they are not hazards. 
So, like in the last presentation, um, they talk about all the type of hazards uh, we have to deal with, and um, with the, especially with the coming modernization act. Um, traditionally, we think about biological, chemical, physical, but then there are some other varieties that, from our perspective, it, it still can be grouped as within these three major categories. Um, radiological hazards uh, is re related to the radiation treatment. The problem in this case was when the radiation event ha happened in Japan, it was more like an environmental problem. It's, it's not, it was not a radiation treatment. It was a contamination of the environment with radioactive compounds. So then the food will have radioactive compounds that came from the environment, not from the treatment. Um, now we'll, we'll have to think about how to deal with them. Um, one of the latest conference that showed that I was, uh, there was some people selling irradiation treatment in Japan, like equipment for irradiation in Japan. So you have to know this kind of concept to, to know that uh, when radiation is good and when radiation is bad. Uh, toxin, pesticide, parasites, drug residues are, are common hazards that we more or less know how to deal with them. Some like the decomposition, uh, food getting spoiled, um, is um, more like a sensory analysis. There have been this some problem in uh, food getting, uh, producing toxins for yeast and mold, especially in grains and in bakeries. The problem there is not, it's not that the chemistry of the food is being spoiled, it's a, a microbial -like agent producing some toxins and those toxins are the ones that make us sick. So in one side it's a quality problem and it's a food losses and food waste problem from a safety and human consumption perspective is uh, what makes us sick. Um, and probably the, the, the two hazard, two categories for hazards are uh, difficult to comprehend maybe the illegal additives and uh, economical motivated adulterants because these are uh, um, more difficult to track, to detect. And we don't know who's doing some chemistry that uh, we don't know what's happening. Um, so we don't know may, where it may be coming from. Uh, we may not have the methods to detect them yet. Um, so that's why uh, this, uh, this is one of our efforts to kind of uh, start putting all the hazards that we know together and the hazards that occur in food. And if we can have a way to classify them um, and compare them, maybe, maybe making our, our learning of food safety hazards and management of food safety hazards easier. Um, if you look to the three major categories, like biological, chemical, and physical, uh, biological may be divided in four categories, like from parasites to viruses. And each category will have a subcategory. There's bacteria, maybe different type of bacteria, Listeria, Salmonella, E. coli, and some other that we don't know if they are pathogens. Um, that's where the idea of knowing your enemy, uh, knowing the hazard is uh, becomes useful. Like if we want to classify aflatoxins, um, as a biological hazard, um, aflatoxin is a chemical produced by a biological agent. So the the yeast or the mold or the bacteria may not necessarily do the harm. The ones that causes the harm is the chemical. So we may not be we may not have the the cell or the little animal there, but the chemical that it was produced and it was left in the food. This is the one that's going to cause a problem. So it, it will be a different way to detect 
a chemical than detecting a, a biological agent. Uh, Brian's as another uh, new hazard. It is, was detected in cows. Um, I was talking with a colleague of Brian's. Uh, he says it's, it's, it's a protein, like the protein that we consume for, for health and nutrition. But it's like a bad protein, like a cancer cell. It's a modified protein that uh, causes problems. So there may be some proteins that are have a different structure that we may be detecting as protein, but uh, it causes problems. So this is some like new science happening around food safety. New proteins that are being discovered that cause problems in humans. Or events like the Ebola problem. Uh, everyone was talking about Ebola, is people getting sick in Africa and all the news about that, but uh, can it happen in full? Uh, do we have to uh, a preventative control for Ebola in, in a food processing plant? Uh, there was not too much talk about that. And then there was a, a news released by the International Union of Food Science and Technology, and they say that Ebola is not likely to happen in full. So we don't have to worry about getting sick from Ebola in the food system. So, so these three type of uh, hazards, they are known to cause problems in people, but they, been, they may not be necessarily a living thing and we have to treat them different. So they may not be necessarily biological hazards. In the group of the chemical hazards, um, I still haven't, we try to talk with food chemists and it is a method to classify chemicals like we do with bacteria based on their detection method. But uh, there is not like a, one single method where we can detect all the chemicals that are different from the food chemicals, especially because some of them like allergens is the same food material, is the milk material that causes the problem, is the fish material or uh, the soy protein. Um, so some of them, when we're detecting them, it's the same food. It's just that some people get sick from it. Some, of, some others are natural to the food, like toxins in beans or some uh, um, um, new plants or new type of animals that we may be consuming that we didn't know that they have a chemical naturally produced natural with from the food but some people get sick from it. it's potatoes some of some varieties of potatoes they have toxins so it's just as uh, naturally occurring uh, chemicals in food material so when we're dealing with this type of uh, chemical hazards it's about knowing the food and the people that get sick from there's some other introduced into the food during the processing or during the handling um, like a pesticide veterinary residues additives processing residues like irradiation residues uh, uh, heating or any other type of uh, uh, processing uh, that we do and it causes a problem um, we have to know how to at, at which pro, at which point we can process the food, or with which type of materials are we dealing with um, um, when we, when we are processing the food because there may be some packaging that is in contact with the food that, that introduces the chemical into the food, and this everything that happens in the environment where the food is produced that uh, it can contaminate the food like we talk about radiation. And probably the most difficult to track is the chemicals we don't know. Um, maybe being produced to, to using the food and maybe causing people getting sick. So these are uh, three examples on, on what is a, a chemical that may, uh, we may have 
problems classifying um, irritants uh, like uh, pepper, hot sauce, uh, onion, garlic. It's, it, it make us uh, cry a bit, but it, it won't it won't kill the person. Is it a, is this a food safety hazard? Uh, it just get you just get hot from the pepper, but uh, it it won't go from there. So we just have to maybe health and safety hazard. Um, we can put it as a as a property of the material that we're dealing with. Radiological compounds. Um, if it's about having radioactive materials in the food. Where did it come from? Did it come from processing or did it come from environmental contamination of the water and the and the farm? Uh, some others uh, group has been talk about nutritional hazards, uh, hazards related to to the nutritional components of the food. Um, this is kind of a if we consume too much sodium or we consume too much uh, uh, some of the chemicals are added to the supplement um, are beneficial at some point, but uh, it's, it's the excess of these nutri nutrients that causes the problem. So it may be natural on the food, we are just getting concentrated and getting to, to a point where it becomes a hazard. So um, what we're looking here is um, a way to classify hazards in a manner that we can know and we can have an idea where we can find the hazard. If we know where we can find the hazard, we may know better how to treat it. Like a allergen is a food material problem we have to know that when we are dealing with food materials, it may become contaminated in the storage environment or in the processing environment. When we're dealing with hazards related to production, to processing, you have to find out the chemicals. Right? Um, or we're looking for pesticides. Um, we look to the treatment of the plants in the farm. Um, maybe different pesticides for uh, treating uh, bugs or, or mice inside the, inside the facility. So we're kind of narrowing down to the areas where the hazard can be found. Um, especially pesticides, so we have to screen for a lot of pesticides and we may not have a way to analyze the whole catalog of pesticides. We can start uh, tackling the, the type of pesticides that are more more likely to occur in the environment that we're looking for. And some of the physical hazards, uh, this is based on, on, on the type of material that the physical hazard um, is made of. Um, we have fiber and wood, which is natural to plants, polymers or plastics, glass and ceramic and metals. Uh, of people uh, interested in sanitary equipment design. This is important for them having a construction material that is not toxic and it doesn't contaminate the food with chemicals. Uh, from a physical hazard point of view is the size of the hazard and if we can get caught by a metal or a glass and ceramic. So how to classify some hazards like uh, pineapple thorns, it can cause a problem when we eat them. Uh, it may be difficult to to deal with if we're dealing with pineapples. Uh, it's a milk stones, uh, wine crystals that happen in a specific food that we have to know the food, if, we, if the food can uh, produce some type of physical hazard. Some others related to packaging, like pack tags, a break. Uh, we used to be uh, uh, heavy on on pencil ca uh, pen caps and jewelry and small items. Uh, do we have uh, something in the package that can break and, and can get into the product? 
some other that may be confusing, like heavy metals. Uh, heavy metals is more a chemistry problem that happen in beer. It's not necessarily something that is going to cut your throat when you are consuming. So this may be in a different category. It's a different way to to treat the problem. So that's the logic of uh, putting um, categorizing food safety hazards based on what they do and how we control them. Then another thing of, uh, that we have to understand when we're dealing with hazards is that the consequence is different. Um, like a modernization act is calling for is pay more attention to the hazards that have severe adverse health consequences, what they call sacoda hazards. So they may be biological, chemical, physical, but these are the most wanted hazards, the ones that can kill faster or you need a lower dose to to get injured or the ones that are killing people more, more often. So this may be classified as a class one recall hazard. They call it sacoda hazard. It may be motivated economically, uh, like in the case of melanin or toxic uh, oils. They do it because of economic gain, but the consequence is the problem. Uh, we talk about uh, 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 economically motivated adulterants, uh, like uh, adding uh, common oil instead of extra virgin olive oil. Um, that, that will not kill the person. Uh, it won't be a uh, hazard related recall, but uh, or the horse meat instead of cow meat. Um, it's more a quality problem. It'd be useful to include them uh, in the plan and have a way to control them. But this is maybe taking a away from the focus of the, the hazards that are they're really killing people. So this is a um, more how to prioritize hazards based on what each hazard do. So we have two factors. One is uh, the type of hazards based on what the hazard is made of. And the other is uh, for the capacity of the hazard to do harm. There are some some bacteria that is more virulent than others. The two of them are bacteria, but some of them kill faster than others. Um, so that, that's what the next question is. Um, do you agree that we have to prioritize based on the consequence? Um, okay. Like, uh, yep, yep. Uh, okay, so the full question is, do you agree with the criteria of presented for prioritizing hazards based on their consequences. Uh, I, I've just typed a bit lazy, so I've just typed in, do you agree, yes or no, in the sidebar. So if you could just answer that poll. Um, I think uh, I'd be answering yes here, I think, uh, Oscar. I, I've got very little knowledge, but I think I'd be saying it's a good idea to prioritize. Um, and we've got 98% say yes and 2% say no. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so then uh, that kind of it, it gets, us, gets us back into management, right? It, it based on, it's based on priority. So one of the tools that are be, is being used more often in the hazard in the hazard plans is the the risk matrix, right? And we cut, we rank. Um, determine the risk based on what the, the consequences from that to my reactions and the frequency of how often it occurs. So if it kills people every day, this is the top priority. If it's just a, a irritation every year, that's a low priority. But then if we have to focus more in the hazards that kill people, we can rank them different and give more points for what the hazard do. Um, even if it happens every year, one death every year is a is a big problem. Right? One one death every hundred years, or so. 
so now we're we're managing risk and we're managing the hazard based on on the risk that they represent which is based on what they do and how often they happen um and then it comes with controls uh, and the microbiology the score hurdles um and the this is a uh, the project uh, that i'm working on um just going to show, show a little quick um we're trying to to match each hazard with the food where they occur how to control it how to monitor it and at which level we can monitor them so for me that uh, when we're talking about control and preventative controls and control measures we will have a lot of options um, we have to know how to differentiate these options and when to implement the uh, best controls that we can have uh, for example if you look into physical hazards we have magnet filters we have metal detectors x-ray detectors we have to remember that uh, the control is some controls are intention is to remove the hazard so we may be detecting it but if we don't take it out of the food it's just detection that nothing was done there was no fixing of the problem and then there are some uh control methods that are specific so some type of material there's some control methods that are more broad spectrum where we can detect more hazard so we can classify control methods based on the type of hazards that they can control. And we can classify controls methods based on the effectiveness of what they do from prevention to removing the hazards from, from the food material or from the environment where the food is produced. And this is kind of uh, related to the decision taking that we used to do what we do with the hazard plan um where for this identify hazard we have to have the control right there is no way to if we identify a hazard at some point we have to put a control then the questions are the, now we have a control but what, what what are the capabilities of the control will it decrease the hazard will it increase do we have uh subsequent controls and then we prioritize from control po from a point that doesn't have hazards to a point that is controlled to a point that has to be controlled with more emphasis. So um, the point of having a critical control point was this is what we have to pay more attention to. Then uh, what the Modernization Act is talking about is uh, do we have to have control points that are priority? Um, or do we have to control everything? And there are different types of controls based on what they do. Um, so do we have to prioritize or not? Um, and there's, there's a, that's the question for, for the group. Um, do you think that a um, control measure that is designed to reduce a hazard or a control measure that is designed to eliminate a hazard should be priority compared to control measures that are designed just to prevent a hazard. Like if we have a metal detector or a pasteurization treatment or um, um, sanitation step, should it be, should we pay more attention to the cleaning step where the bacteria is killed um, or not compared to all the other control measures? Okay, yeah, I've loaded that in the sidebar again. Um, the full question, do you think that controls designed to reduce uh, or eliminate occurrence, <coughs> occurrence of hazards should be prioritized? Uh, yes or no? And again, um, it's overwhelmingly, yes, 98%. Um, I, think, I think they should be prioritized. Yeah. And I guess uh, that's what will be coming, and it's I guess a matter of assurance. Um, even if we don't call it critical control point, 
if uh, the, for example, the FDA say that um, salmonella is very likely to occur in fruit and vegetables, then we have to have a, something to prevent salmonella occurring in fruit and vegetables. And we have to prove that, uh, we have to, to prove it two, two ways. One is it's not going to happen. And, or if we have a method to, to kill salmonella, we have to prove that the control measure kills salmonella. So we have to get information on, if, if we decide not to not to wash the product, we may have to prove why not why not to wash the product when we're, we, we're being told that the hazard is going to occur. Right? And then if we have a, if we say, they are saying that we have to control it, is my control measure effective? Do, do I have a, they say that I have to control someone else. Now the control measure that I have, is it doing its job? Is it effective? So it's, if, we, if we want to get the assurance, we have to have a method that is effective. Like if we want to give assurance of product is peanut free, we have to have control methods to control the peanut and control methods that assure that the product is peanut free. If we want to ensure gluten free, we have to have control measures for gluten not occurring in the food. Um, examples of control measures or for biologicals, um, it, it, we use a concept of hurdles for biological, chemical, and physical. There are biological hazards from viruses that kill uh, pathogens to competitive flora that don't, don't let the pathogen grow because they consume, they, they uh, fill the environment. Chemical hazards, uh, chemical controls that are killing the microbe from inside the food, killing the microbe in the environment, or just removing any material where the microbe can grow. So have physical hazards that are uh, specifically added for pasteurizing the food material to other physical hazards that are designed to uh, use preserving, not allowing the uh, pathogen to grow. Also, others that are just preventing the food material to get contaminated. So we have different preventative controls or control measures. Some of them may be uh, specifically designed to remove the hazard. So uh, if we have a, a priority hazard to take care of, we maybe have to think about ways to, to be more effective in, in removing the hazard from the, from the food or from the environment. Um, like in the fruit and vegetable uh, sector, there is a, a bit of fight in uh, car boxes and plastic containers. Um, the car box industry is saying that um, car box is safer. I was uh, studying in the University of Guelph here in Ontario first, uh, a few years ago. Now it's a university in Italy. They're also saying that uh, car box is better than plastic. Maybe because uh, the cleaning of the plastic boxes is not working. Plastic boxes may be, uh, may be good if they were sanitized and, and maintained, but uh, for some reason, either the cleaning people is not doing their job, or after they are clean, they are not handled properly. So th there'll be the more. Uh, hazards that we have to control, that are mandatory to control, the more of this type of uh, situation that we're going to face on um, some control measures be more effective than others. And that depends on how we use them. Uh, and this is what we do things like root cause analysis of, uh, is it the plastic, the, is the washing the plastic not working? Why is not working and how we can make it more effective? If we cannot make it more effective, we better use car box instead of plastic. And you can have an argument on environmental impacts. 
and you can improve any of them for uh, lowering the environmental impact. Um, the last person is the monitoring uh, of the hazards and the hazard limits. Because of new hazards uh, being discovered, as a, we have to, as scientists have to come up with new technologies to detect the hazards. And not all the technologies may have the capability at this point. So when we are determining ways to monitor the hazard and which limits can we tolerate, we have to consider how capable science is of dealing with hazards at this point. And this will be also related to specifications that we can give in the product. Like, uh, is peanut free? Can we guarantee what is peanut free? At which level? Um, is it free from E. coli, free from metal contamination? Um, at, at which level? Um, and this comes to monitoring methods. Like, um, for water, we use coliforms and E. coli because these are the indicator microorganisms that can happen in water. Um, and there are some methods that can handle a larger sample. Like a, we can have like a liter of water being filtered and see if we can find one bacteria in one liter. Uh, like we're talking with a person that is uh, in, the, in the sector of uh, microbial methods, the coliform, they don't include salmonella. So if, if you're going to have a method that can detect salmonella, better have the enterobacteria group and there are methods to monitor enterobacteria. Um, we can do two total counts or we can have an instrument to detect all of them like parasites and viruses but then for sample size reduces or we may not have the capability to eliminate all the bacteria from the from the food. Um, so this is a trade-off we focus on the hazards that are priority, like E. coli, salmonella, listeria, and we use only the methods to detect those, and then we give tolerance to the rest of the uh, naturally occurring organisms, or we eliminate all of them from the food material. Uh, we have methods to detect all of them. Um, So that's what the next question is. What is preferable to have a, a test that can monitor all the hazards in a small sample or a test that can monitor a specific hazard in a larger sample? Okay. Uh, what is preferable? A broad spectrum test in a small sample, that's A, or a limited spectrum test in a large sample. That's B. If you could just uh, cast your vote there. Uh, now this one, it's coming. It's coming out sixty forty in favour of A. So a broad spectrum <coughs> test, testing a small sample. Um, okay. So what, what say you, Oscar? Yeah, I guess uh, the depend on the on the capacity and also the situation, like. Uh, if we have a, a supply, a product that we don't know, this is related to the supplier verification program. Right? Like we don't know how the how the product was made, uh, especially like uh, uh, adulterants um, or like uh, um, the economically motivated uh, mati uh, adulterants or uh, fraudulent chemicals. We don't know which chemical is going to be there, right? So it would be better to have a test that can detect any chemical that is different from the food. Um, it's happened with pesticides. If we don't know what pesticides, or we, we don't, the supplier cannot tell us which pesticide he uses, or we don't trust the information that they provide. We have to test for all the possible pesticides in oh, that, that, that has been uh, determine that can happen. So we have to have a test that tests 60, 80 pesticides. Um, 
if we know that uh, and it, we trust the information on the supplier, we only use five pesticides. Uh, we give the information on uh, this is the pesticide we use, and we use them at the uh, uh, right harvesting period. So by now, the pesticide should be degraded. We can have a. Uh, we only have to test for these five pesticides. Right? So we trust your information. Now we just have to validate from the five pesticides that you use, are they still residues or not? Um, and same happened with E. coli. Or, and when we talk about having total counts, do we have to test for all the microbes or we focus in Salmonella, Listeria, and E. coli? Um, also, there are new methods being developed, rapid methods, and there are uh, faster to produce results. And we, we can do some quick swabbing and the same afternoon have the result, and then we can release the product. Um, we may have to, to deal with a smaller sample, and there are some official methods that take uh, one or two days to get the results. We can analyze a faster sample. Um, that's up. It's easier to see with allergens. Uh, some of the allergen, allergens are better known. And now there are methods to detect them in the food, especially in mixed foods, where we may have uh, milk protein with soy protein and uh, almond protein. And how, we, how we can detect the milk protein within all this protein. How we can detect soy protein within this food matrix. Um, so there, there be some complications, but we have to have a quick result um, in order to release the product. But we can have an official method that is uh, proven that can detect the hazard in a mixed sample. But then we have to do some extraction and additional steps to to get the result. Um, what happens? Uh, we're talking about. Um, one of the news that um, the FDA has been called to attention to improve the, re the recall system. So they have to speed up the recall system. So to speed up the recall system, they have to produce results from the laboratory faster. <coughs> and part of the delays on the recalling system is that um, the, the laboratory analysis. So it's better to use a, a rapid method that can give a false positive or a false negative, or an official method that can give a better answer. So that's what the last question is. It's preferred to, to have a rapid method, like a ATP testing, and do a lot of ATP testing, or a more accurate method, like microbiological testing, but a, a limited amount of times, like a, we do ATP testing every day, or we do microbiological testing every week or every month. Which which would be preferable? Okay, <clears throat> I've uh, set the poll again in the sidebar. The final poll: What is preferable? A, an unlimited amount of environmental ATP testing, or B, a limited amount of environmental microbiological testing. And the results are 60-40 in favor of B, a limited amount of environmental microbiological testing. Yeah, yeah and this is uh, related to previous questions. It comes to probabilities. Um, the ATP testing is giving, is giving quick, fast results. It may not be that reliable, um, but other methods give uh, more accurate results may not uh we may be losing like if we test every month and we, and we detect the problem one month after the problem happens then we lose one month of product so uh related to management uh, what we can do is to have both rapid testing every day um and validate the rapid testing with an official method so even if we know that ATP testing does a lot of mistakes, um, what, we're, what we're using the microbiological testing is to detect the mistakes of ATP. 
um, if ATP is proven that it's doing its job, then it's more cost effective to keep doing quick testings more often. But so we, if we have to recall, we, we have to recall less product. It's a, like one of the standards that I work with. Um, it, it suggests that metal detection should be monitored every hour rather than every four hours or once a day. The problem of uh, monitoring once a day is that the whole day will have to be recalled if the problem is detected. If we do a detection every hour, it's just the last hour of product that will be recalled. So in summary, there is a variety of management tools for hazards. We have to use them accordingly. Um, a more logical classification of hazards based on science and where the hazard can be found who have some potential benefits. Not only to compare them and to get to know them, but also to manage them and to control them and eliminate them if we can. Um, then if we are selecting control methods, there'll be some that are more effective. So how we compare them based on their effectiveness. Um, when we're monitoring the hazard, there'll be a few factors to consider uh, in their selection. Time to obtain results, sample size that we can process, and specificity to the hazard, and reliability. We have rapid methods that make mistakes, more errors, but then th that's how we have uh, more specific and accurate methods to to reduce the, the mistakes on the on the rapid method. Um, this is uh, one of the projects I'm talking about. If you'd like to learn more or you'd like to contribute to this project, um, we call it the Safe Food Renovator. It's like a repository where we're trying to collect this information and put it in a manner that uh, would be useful to analyze. Uh, the idea is that the more information we have about hazards and how we control them, we can be more innovative in selecting control methods, um, creating food safety plans that are more effective, um, especially if we have to make decisions based on science, if we have to prove why not control this hazard, if we have to prove why do we have to control this hazard. Uh, we have to take a decision based on information that is available. Um, that has to be easier to find. So if you like the idea, just get in touch with us. Um, we'll be happy to co collaborate on, on, on this project. OK, great. Thanks very much. So that Safe Food uh, Renovator, is that um, a website that's up and running at the moment, uh, Oscar? Yeah, this moment is under construction, but uh, there's a, there's a website and there are some videos related to OK, if you can stop sharing your slides, uh, Oscar. There's a lot of uh, good information there. Uh, I've got to say, in the early presentations, some of the slides were not clear. Maybe the streaming was a bit bad, so it was a bit blurry. But uh, as we got into it more, um, it was a lot of uh, great information presented there. And uh, lots of discussion. It's nice to see the discussion and people asking questions and actually other attendees answering those questions in the sidebar. So thanks very much, Oscar. And thanks for all the attendees for your contributions throughout. Um, if anybody does have a specific question for Oscar related to this uh, content, uh, this presentation, please uh, type it in the sidebar now. Um, if you can stop sharing your slides, Oscar, just click, this, click the stop sharing button. Um, and we'll just wait for, a moment, <coughs> wait for a moment to see if we've got any, um, any questions. Um, there was questions, a lot of questions related to mold. Uh, somebody's got a problem with mold in herring uh, product container. Uh, and so people were uh, 
offering advice related to that. Okay. Well, if there are no questions, um, no problem. Once we send the video and the slides over to you, um, and maybe you, you uh, might have a question for Oscar, you can go direct to that uh, new website that's um, listed on the presentation slides. Okay. So, Oscar, are you, can you hear me, Oscar? Yeah, I, you, I think you're on mute. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll just say, Oscar, um, we've gone past the hour. We're 10 past, so uh, we'll leave it at that for today. Thanks very much for your contribution today. Much appreciated. And um, we'll see you again uh, in the near future. And good luck with the project. Brilliant. Thanks, too. Okay. Thanks very much, Oscar. Um, I've loaded in the side by your certificate. Um, as mentioned previously, there, is, there isn't a Food Safety Fridays webinar next week. We're off for a few weeks. 19th of August, we'll be back with Ruth Bell. Uh, and that will be trending root cause analysis for continual improvement. Um, so join us for that. Also, we will be announcing shortly Food Safety Live 2016, our full day conference, that will be a blend of back-to-back -back webinars and discussion. Um, if you're watching this, I always forget this, if you're watching this in the future, i.e. not live now, either on the IFSQM website or on YouTube, please comment, uh, comment, uh, like, subscribe, share. Um, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're almost at a thousand subscribers. So put your comments on there and click like, share, spread, spread the message and spread the word of IFSQN and the Food Safety Fridays team. Okay, thanks for your contributions today. As I say every week, uh, Friday's the best day of the week. Have a lovely day. Enjoy your weekend and we'll see you on the next Food Safety Fridays. Okay, take care. Bye.